Hey everyone, welcome to the Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is Carol Ann Flood, and I'm the worship director here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Our mission is simple, to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. So whether you've been following Jesus your whole life, or your journey has just begun, we hope that this message will help you draw near to the person of Jesus, be challenged and encouraged by His Word, and be moved to action. We hope these next few moments are a blessing to you and equip you to see who God really is and who you are in Him. Wow, what an awesome morning already, huh? Man, so hungry, so excited for what God has for us today. Uh, I started running a couple weeks ago, and uh, I know a lot of you in the room, you've heard me talk before about running, and you, you might be asking, like, eh, doesn't look like it, right? Haven't noticed, can't tell, David. Uh, but I started running a couple weeks ago. I signed up for a 5K, and I was like, I'm going to do this. And Shannon looked at me, and she goes, you're not going to do this. I'm deleting it from the calendar. So that's the, the encouraging support I have at home. I said, I'm going to do it, I promise. So I went out the next day. I ran my first run. I was slow. I was awfully slow slow. Uh, so slow that I ran, I think it was a 14 minute mile and I walked three times. So that, that was my baseline, right? I was like, okay, the next day I could probably do better than this. I started working up. Uh, but by the time my third run ran around, we met as a small group and there was a girl in our small group that said, Hey, I have an idea for you. There's this app that you can download and it's like a running coach. This coach will, like, they talk to you in your ear and they tell you, like, speed up or slow down or you're doing awesome. And I was like, I could use like a little pep talk when I'm, when I'm hacking up a lung. So I download this thing. And it was my third run, right? So I go out on this run and I'm excited. Like I'm hopeful, I'm, I'm anticipating like this, this is going to propel me, right, to hit maybe a 13 and a half minute mile rather than a 14. I was like, this is going to speed it up for me. And so I get in, I start running and it, it's kind of the pace setter, right? There, there's this run that you do where it figures out like, what's your baseline? So I start running and it's probably measuring my heart rate. I didn't look into it too much, but I'm running and over and over and over. I'm not even kidding. Every 30 seconds, here's the message I hear. Not good job. Job, not way to go, not you're awesome. It's, it's this, slow down, slow down, slow down. But it started, it was almost like personalized. It was almost uncomfortable. Uh, it said, slow down, David, please slow down. Please slow down. I mean, I am running. I'm giving it all I have. I'm training, right, for a 5K every 30 seconds over and over and over. Please slow down, David. Please slow down. Please slow down. I start getting mad. I start getting frustrated. I'm like, this is not going to propel. Like when I run the race, if I run at the pace that this app wants me to run, the race will be done by the time I cross the finish line. No one will be there. So I keep running and running and faster and faster. I'm getting angrier and angrier right until the end where this thought comes into my mind. And I go, is that you, God? I've heard it so many times. Slow down, David. Slow down, David. Slow down, David. Please slow down, David. Slow down. You're running too fast. Slow down. I don't think it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me in that moment, but it could have been. It could have been based on the pace of the rest of my life. This is a theme that I've heard over and over and over and over all throughout in my prayer life, devotional life, as I've had coaches and mentors. It doesn't matter what it is. I've heard this over and over and over. Please slow down. Slow down, David. Please slow down. I'm convinced that if God was into NASCAR, who knows if he is or not, but if he was, he would be the pace car. That's what I'm convinced. I, I think God is, is the pace car. He sets the pace. Everybody else is behind him. And so I, I want to follow this analogy. So if God is the pace car, then this is me, right? I'll follow you, God, but with no space between my bumper and yours. I'm going to be right there enough that like I can push the gas just a little bit. I can move you forward. I can propel us. I, I can pick up our pace. It's funny that I have to preach this message to you on waiting on God because I'm awful at it. I'm awful at it. This has been a struggle. This has been an area of growth for me and for my life. So here's what I'm going to do for the next 30 minutes or so. I'm going to preach to myself. I'm going to preach to myself and I'm going to hope and I've already prayed that maybe this hits one of you. Now maybe you can look or you can listen or you can reflect back on your life and you might see maybe there's an area of my life that God wants me to slow down, that he wants me to check my pace, that he wants me to follow him, that he wants me to bring into alignment the pace that he actually has for us. So are you waiting on God for anything? Like right now, as you sit, as you reflect, as you think, is there anything that you've been asking for or praying for? 
or waiting for that God could actually provide because of this statement. Making space for God to move in our lives requires us to adjust our pace to his. This whole series, right, is about making space, carving out space so that God can speak, so that God can move. But it's not just about the space, it's also about our pace, And that's what I want to talk about today. We're going to be in Exodus 40 is our first passage. It's Moses and the Israelites, uh, and they're they're moving through the wilderness. I'll show you a picture of what it actually looked like in a second. But they're moving through the wilderness, uh, and it starts like this. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting, which looked like this, right? This is the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had, everybody say this word with me, settled on it. Because the cloud had settled, the Holy Spirit had settled on top of it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The word settled, is, it actually means yeshab. Yeshab, that, that's the word, or that's the actual word that was used in the language. Yeshab means to sit, or to remain, or to dwell. So when it says the, the, the spirit of God came and rested on top of the tent of meeting, on top of the tabernacle, it sat there for a while. And so the people wouldn't move. Let's keep reading. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, then they did not set out until the day that it had lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, And fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during their travels. If God was in a NASCAR, God would be the pace car. All of the people, all of the Israelites, all of them, as they're following the Lord, they could literally see a tangible expression of God's presence right in front of them. It would be a cloud and the cloud would sit. And if the cloud sat, the people sat. And then if the cloud moved, the people moved. And they could see it by day. They could see it by night. Their pace was set by God. I mean, that's hard. Can we just call that for a second? That's hard to do, especially when things aren't great. So here's a picture of the wilderness, all right? This is where they're living. What they've been promised is God said, I'm going to lead you to the promised land. I'm going to lead you to a land flowing of of milk and honey. There's going to be abundance and security. You're going to have your own land, your own permanency. I'm going to dwell among you here. I'm, I'm bringing you to this place, but right now I need you to wait on me. And so they waited here. Desolate. Dry, sandy, right? Not a lot of waterfalls, not a lot of awesome hikes that you go out and do right here. Not a lot of animals you might be excited about seeing. Like this is a desolate desert that God actually has his people in and they're waiting. So I want you to get this. These are real people. This isn't just a fable. It's not just some story. These are real people that are waiting in circumstances where they've been promised bigger and better, but their reality stinks. And yet they wait. They might be cranky. They might be sweaty. They might be frustrated. They might be confused. But the people actually wait. And it forces them to wrestle with this question. It's the same question we have to wrestle with too. Am I going to keep waiting? Because they didn't have to. God didn't create robots. He, He created people. Who could decide, who could make decisions, who, who, who could, could allow their hearts to lead and dictate their actions. And so God doesn't want to program us to do something. God wants to invite us to do something. So the people have to wrestle. Are we going to wait or are we going to go on our own? Even if that means without the presence of God. This isn't the first time that God's people had to do this waiting on God. 16 chapters earlier, uh, the text is Exodus 24, verse 12. It says this, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and say these two words with me. Stay here. Stay here and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandments I have written for their instruction. Stay here. The word is shakan. Shakan, it means to remain or to dwell. Are you seeing a theme? God invites Moses. He says, Moses, I want you to go up this tall mountain. You saw a picture of what the terrain looks like. God invites him. He says, I want you to go up the mountain and rest. Sit. Dwell. 
and I have something for you. So stay here. I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments that I have written for their instruction. This is a long passage. We'll read it all the way through. Then Moses set out with Joshua, his aide. So he gets a buddy. So Joshua and Moses, they head up the mountain. So when Moses went up on the mountain of God, he said to the elders, wait here for us. There's that word again. Wait, wait, wait. Are you seeing it? Over and over and over. Wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and her are with you. And anyone involved in a dispute, you can go to them. Right? That's like mom and dad are leaving. Oldest is in charge. You go, maybe don't go to them. Just call us. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. You know what's not in that text? Moses got whiny and complainy. He starts asking a thousand questions like my toddler does at home. Right? The word, why? 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 Why do I have to go up? Why do I have to wait? How long is it going to take? And what do I need to bring with me? And should I bring meals or should I bring anybody else? Can, can my other friend, you know, James come? I love James. Can, Moses doesn't sit there and ask God a thousand questions. What Moses does, because his pace is in alignment with God, he just goes, okay, Joshua, we're going on a hike. And they go all the way up to the top of the mountain. They go all the way up where Moses waits. It isn't abnormal for the people of God to wait on God. Just let that sink for one second. It is not abnormal. It's all throughout scripture. It is not abnormal for God's people to wait on him. You might even call it a marker. Like, man, how do you know if someone's really following God? Man, their life is probably marked with seasons of waiting. Not just days, not just hours, not just minutes, but maybe weeks or months or years, sometimes decades of just waiting. Of waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. So I want to go back to that question. What are you waiting on God for right now? What's your thing? What's the thing that's consumed your mind? What's the thing that you've been praying about? What's the thing that is unresolved? What's the thing that needs needs God to intervene in it? What's that thing for you? I'll ask it a different way. Where do you wish God would pick up the pace in your life? Where are you not a fan of his pace right now? A couple things maybe it might be for you. Maybe it's a next job. You're discontent with where you're at and you're you're looking or longing for the next thing or the next stop. Maybe it's retirement. You thought you were going to be retiring soon and then the market changed or the job sphere changed or whatever and now things are on hold. Maybe it's engagement you've been waiting for forever. Like, I just want the ring. I want to be engaged. I want to lock this in and be good to go. And it's still not here. Maybe it's marriage. And you say, we, we've done the thing, we've done engagement, we've waited, and then it didn't come or it didn't happen or it didn't take place like we thought or we got surprised. Maybe it's marriage or kids. Maybe it's graduation. Maybe it's where you're going to live next, a degree. Maybe it's something deeper. Maybe it's like healing. Like you've been waiting for healing for something. And you've been coming to God over and over and over. Maybe it's you or maybe it's a, a spouse or a child, or a parent, or a grandparent. You've been waiting to see healing actually take place. Maybe it's remission. Maybe you've been fighting and fighting and fighting treatment after treatment. All you want is the stamp that says you're clear. And you've been waiting for it over and over. So many of us want resolution now that we actually make decisions and we just move ahead without God. Because the angst or the stress or the pressure or the pain of just sitting and waiting feels unendurable. We go, you know what? I'm just going to slide right past this pace car. I'm going to slide right past. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm pretty sure I see where it's going. I'm going to speed things up a little bit. I'm going to give it just a little bump behind. Like, I'm ready to go faster. God, where is it you wish God would just pick up the pace in your life? 
something that jumps out at me in this passage with Moses. Uh, it, Moses is like a real guy. I don't know how you compare yourself to him. I mean, it's like there's not a lot of things that I can go, hmm, I remember when God split the sea in my life or, you know, when God spoke to me on top of the mountain and he handed me tablets that God wrote. It's like seeing God's handwriting. It, it, it's like I, there's a lot of stuff I go, I, I can't relate to that. But I can relate to a lot of emotions that he probably felt. So I, I wanted to have some fun with you, right? Let, let's make the context more modern or today. Uh, let's walk through. You remember how many days Moses sat up on the mountain waiting for God? Six. What do you think he did for six days? How do you think he felt? Like, I, I don't picture Moses and Joshua playing ping pong on top of the mountain, just waiting for God to show up. Like, this is fun, man. Like, if I, if I could walk us through it, here, here's, just entertain this, right? But if I could walk us through it, this is how maybe I see this scene playing out, okay? So day one, Moses and Joshua, they get to the top, right? We're just going to do emojis today, right? Let's text it. We're going to text the story. Day one, Moses and Joshua, they get up, right? Woohoo! party, emoji, hallelujah, hands up, right? Anybody else? You're like, yeah, waiting. Waiting's awesome on day one. God, I'm ready. Okay, so day two. All right, notice the face. You start getting a little sad. You're like, I, I didn't think this would take more than 10 minutes, Lord. I just prayed it. All right, I'm ready. Like, are, are, I'm, I'm good. Okay, like I, I understand yesterday I was a little winded. I was a little sweaty. I was maybe a little overexcited, but now I'm good. Now I'm content, happy to go, right? Day three. We cross your fingers, right? Oh, I really hope it's not going to be too much longer. Cross your fingers. I really hope God's going to still do what I want him to do. Day four, something happens, right? It's not necessarily this way for everybody, but I think the wave is the same for everybody. Day four, maybe we start getting a little entitled. Day, day four, maybe we're less sad or less excited. Maybe day four, we're a little bit more in touch with how we're actually feeling. And we're a little bit frustrated that it's actually taken this long. Because if you remember, like this is Moses, right? Let's talk Moses. God told Moses to hike the mountain. Moses hiked the mountain. But I don't think Moses brought up like a cooler. Like at some point, the physical things start playing it, right? It's like now you're hungry. Now you're thirsty. Now, now you're sweaty. Like you've been sitting in these clothes this entire time. You're on top of the mountain. Maybe you're cold. You didn't anticipate it was going to be this long. Like you start getting frustrated because the timeline you had in mind is not the same that you are actually living out with God. So day four, it's a little bit more entitled. Day five, it, tar it starts to turn. This is what it is for me. You start getting blamey. You know what I'm talking about? I love my wife. My wife loves to point this out in me when I hit here. And I hit here way faster than day five. Right? You start getting blamey. I start getting irritable. I start getting upset, frustrated. Right? And, and, and what's funny too is I, I point at God and I go, God, you told me to do this. You told me to come. I was obedient. I did my part, right? You start pointing. You go, God, you did it. But then all of a sudden, I get in trouble because I start looking other places or at other people sideways. And I go, you didn't make them wait. They got it on the first day. They didn't even have to wait, Lord. I'm so sick of hearing their story about how it, pff, it just dropped out of thin air. And there they were. And here I am. And I've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. How come it didn't happen for them? like it is for me. You notice the emotion, you can feel it rising, right? The intensity gets bigger. Day six, I'm angry. God, you didn't tell me it would, do, it would be like this. You didn't tell me it would take this long. And my fist, maybe instead of pointing, now, now it's closed, right? It's hard to give somebody something when your fist is closed, when you're holding it tightly and gripping it. You're upset because this is the thing that you thought you were due. God promised it or God spoke it or God put it on your heart or you moved to a different place and you're expecting you're in a different job and you're waiting. This was supposed to happen way earlier and, and our fists get like this with God. Can anybody relate to day six? I got whole seasons marked called day six. It affects everything. It affects marriage. It affects work. It affects personal life and prayer life and spiritual life. I mean, it affects day six when I'm just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting, going, God, what are you doing? 
Something happens on day seven. Seven's an interesting number in the Bible. Seven usually means completeness. There's something about when the waiting is complete, where we land is totally different than day six. And at least in my life, it might not be true for your life, but in my life, often day six and day seven are polar opposites. Day seven, I settle in. Day seven, a lot, of, a lot of the superficial emotions like anger or frustration, maybe even entitlement, a lot of those actually start disappearing. There, there's a sense of peace that comes in because all of a sudden it's like, okay, God, I didn't know that all of that was inside of me. I couldn't see it. In fact, as I look back on the season of waiting now that I've been up here on the mountain, I'm a bit embarrassed for how I've acted or how I've prayed, how I've talked, what I've said, what I've thought. Like, like there's this piece where all of a sudden it's like, you know what, God, as I start to reflect on what you've done, on who you are, on how you've led me, on where you've led me, on how you've provided for me, as I look back on all these things, all of a sudden I see a perfect track record. In fact, I see the one that keeps getting in the way or the problematic child is me. And there's something about day seven where we just settle in where we sit, we set up a lawn chair and we go, you know what, it's hot. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I'm sick of fighting, but but I'm just going to sit and go, my heavenly father has always provided. He's always been there. He's always led. He's brought me to this point and he even led me here. So I'm going to rest on this fact. I'm going to trust you like a toddler learns to trust their parents. God, I will sit and I will wait for you for as long as it takes, for as much as required. God, I'll just sit here and I'll wait. Our hands become open. Notice it's on day seven that God speaks to Moses. He gives him his word. And it's not even just for Moses, it's for Moses and God's people. It's the same word that we open up today. God's timing is always perfect, but, but for us to receive what he actually has for us requires us to adjust our pace to his. We have this term in the States, uh, it's called ASAP, right? ASAP stands for as soon as possible. I told you, I hate preaching this message. I've been aware of how many times I've used this acronym all week long, and it is more than I'm willing to admit to you. I move fast, right? I want it now. I want it as soon as possible. ASAP, 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 ASAP. Give it to me. I'm ready. I'm good. I'm good. And, and it's, it's not even just with God. It's kind of with everything. You know what I'm saying? Uh, even training for this 5K. Uh, I was like, I, I don't want to train forever. That sounds awful. Three and a half weeks. Yes. Start looking up couch to 5K plans. I start talking about heart rate, whatever. I just want it now. Just get me there now. I want to go fast ASAP. As soon as possible. Oftentimes, this is how we pray. So when we pray, it's I pray, and then God, if you don't do it ASAP, if you don't do it right now, then I will do for you. So it's really pray, then do. Pray, then do. And usually it's like pray is really short, really tiny, really quick, almost a second thought, and then then we go do, because we're after something as soon as possible. In God's economy, though, God has ASAP too. I believe it would stand for this. Allow space and pray. Just to sit, to remain, to dwell, to sit and do nothing. We're not good at that as a people, as a culture, as a church culture, as a discipling culture, we aren't great at just sitting. But what if that's what God's inviting us to as a people? To just sit and dwell and wait on him. What if that's what he's beckoning us towards today? There is a better way than how most of us function, and it is what I would call the way of Jesus, where we abide, where we sit and remain and dwell 
We allow a lot of those emotions to kind of bubble up and surface. We allow those to come up and we will wait patiently on God to provide in his timing. That is the way of Jesus. Here's a couple characters that lived that way. Moses did it with God on the mountain and then God gave him his word, right? The Ten Commandments. But then there's another character later on, King David. He waited on the Lord for kingship. He was anointed, and then he waited years and years and years to actually step in to the role of king. And when he was king, every battle or every fight or every dispute among nations, what David would do is he would sit and he would wait and he would inquire of the Lord as to what he should do. That's, that's how David's leadership was marked, especially in those early years. Paul, the Apostle Paul, that wrote half of you know, the New Testament that we have today. As Paul wrote it, when Paul actually came to faith in Jesus, it, for three days he had to wait in the house of a prophet. And he waited, and he was blind, and he waited for God to allow those scales to fall off of his eyes so that he could actually do what God had called him to do. Paul sat and waited. And then you look at Jesus, right? Jesus, the night that he was betrayed, which led to the cross, Jesus went up on the hill or on the mountainside or in the garden or wherever it was he went and he just waited and he prayed and he invited his disciples to join in with him and he prayed and he says, not my will, father, but yours. That's what I'm after. So I'll wait and I'll wait on you to guide me, to direct me. I will wait. Here's what I want to say. If it's good for Moses, David, Paul, and Jesus, that's good enough for me. What about you? If it's a marker of people that God said they're mine, that they would wait on him, what an invitation that we have to just sit and wait on him. I stumbled on this quote uh, this last week. It's by Mark Batterson. He's a pastor down south. And he says this, a change of pace plus a change of place equals a change of perspective. What an invite that God gives to us. A change of pace plus a change of place equals a change of perspective. What if what God intends to do in the season of your waiting is to show you something? Or to speak something. Or, or, or to change something in your heart or in your life. What if God is carving out space and the only thing left is for you to change your pace so you actually hear and be led by him? Uh, a couple, well, probably a month ago, a month and a half ago, there's a member of our church uh, who was diagnosed with cancer. So they reached out to me via email, reached out to Brian, just a couple of us just to go, hey, I just want you to know, we've been wondering what this was. Uh, it's been a long summer, went through a number of different treatments and what we finally found out was it was cancer. And so he shared this with us and he, he kind of allows us into this piece of his life and what he's wrestling through. And I, at one point I shared and I just said, you know, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of people that I'm aware of even here at our church that have been diagnosed with cancer. And super nicely, super kindly, gently, respectfully, they said, would you be willing to share those first names with me? As I find myself in a lot of treatment rooms, waiting rooms, time at home where I'm just sitting, I would love to pray for them specifically. Could I have that? So I, I sent seven names. And they've been praying and praying and praying and praying. There have been significant things that have happened even in the lives of others here who have had cancer, who have been diagnosed, who, who maybe didn't even know, maybe even until now, that they've actually been prayed for by name, by someone who is sitting in the same chair as them. It's amazing what waiting and waiting on God and allowing him to lead us actually opens us up to do. It changes our heart, it changes our perspective, it changes our relationship with him. 
It allows us to see the role that we play in his kingdom, the invitation he's giving us right now. Like, I want to meet you, but I also want to invite you to be a part of how I'm meeting needs of other people at the same time. The reason this story just hit me so deeply is I don't know if I would do that. I think there's so many things in my life that if I got that diagnosis or if I ended up in that room or whatever, I I would be so focused on getting out, getting beyond, getting faster, doing, pushing through whatever is required to get out of that stage that I might miss what God is inviting me to in that stage. So I just want to talk to you. If you've been hurting, if you felt lonely, if you felt insecure, maybe disappointed, confused, frustrated. God is trying to meet you in your waiting. And I believe he has something for you. I mean, we sang all these incredible songs this morning about waiting on God. It's so difficult until he shows up. And then it's, it, it's indescribable. So just as we close today, I just want to ask two questions. Question number one is this. What is God asking you to wait on him for? What is it? You might have known in the first minute of this sermon, I don't want to let that go. I just want to push. I want to plow. I I want this thing and I want it now. Maybe that's the thing that God is trying to bring your attention to. What is the thing that God is asking you to wait on him for? Not anybody else, but just on him. Question number two, we often miss this, is who are you going to invite to wait with you? Moses brought up Joshua on top of the mountain. Jesus brought his disciples. David often had a lot of his advisors, leaders. God surrounded us with each other. He's given you a small group. He's given you a church. He's given you maybe a a spouse or children or parents or siblings, friends, coworkers. Who is God inviting to wait with you? And would you let them in on that waiting? So we're just going to carve out some space to move on from here. We hope this message encouraged you in seeing who God is and who you are in Him. If you want to take a next step, visit frontlinegr.com forward slash connect. We look forward to connecting with you there, and we'll see you back here next week.